Listen and read along with me as we uh, read the scripture passage on which the teaching is based this morning. It's John chapter 12, reading from verses 41 to 50. John 12, 41 to 50. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. And then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. This is God's word. Now what we're doing in a series, uh, both before and after Christmas, here in the wintertime, is we're looking at what uh, we've called basic vocabulary or basic concepts of faith and spirituality. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, which was a very early summary of the most basic uh, core uh, elements of, of the faith, the Christian faith, and then we're looking at some place in the Gospel of John uh, to give content to each one of these uh, terms, each one of these concepts, because both the Apostles' Creed and the Gospel of John are both uh, dedicated to basic concepts. Now, today we get to a, the place in the Apostles' Creed that reads about Jesus, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Some of you might remember the older version where it says he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The idea, I, I, when I was a little kid, I used to think some are trying to get away from his judgment. And uh, the judge shows up and he's even going to catch the quick ones. But what it really means, of course, in the, in the term quicksand and the term quicksilver, the old term quicksilver, quick just means living. And what it means is that Jesus Christ will come to judge everyone who has ever lived. Now, needless to say, this is not a popular basic concept. Um, judgment. You know, all I know is uh, there's a very, very successful uh, advertising campaign for Crunch Gyms that says, no judgments. No judgment. You go to, into the uh, Barnes & Noble and you look at the huge spirituality section and you see it saying, care of the soul, chicken soup of the soul. But I've yet to see the great new bestseller, Judgment Day for the soul. It, it's, it has, nobody wants to hear about it. On the other hand, what I want to show this morning is in spite of that fact, in spite of the fact that judgment is, is extremely unpopular, the idea of a God who comes down and smites, you know, a God who comes down and sees people doing things that are wrong and smites them and judges them. On the one hand, I want to show that modern people who've gotten rid of this idea because they say it's primitive at best or dangerous at worst. Primitive at best or dangerous at worst have not really faced up to how much they need a judging God. How much they need the idea of a divine judgment. How much they need judgment day. But I'm also going to show that the gospel which is the Christian understanding of judgment day is much more nuanced, much more complex uh, much more multifaceted than the, uh, the superficial view that the average person has of the idea of Judgment Day. Uh, let's take a look and see what this text says. This is, as I'm going to show you, this is the very last thing Jesus says in public. In the Gospel of John, these are the last things he says in public. The very next thing that comes after this in John 13, he, he retires to his disciples the night before he dies. So this is his, the end of his public ministry, the last thing he says. And it's about judgment. Now, what does he teach us here? Four things we learn. And you know, I usually tell you the four things ahead of time, don't I? 
Uh, but you know what? I can't give you the four points ahead of time because it'll give away the story. So I'm just going to have to give them to you one at a time. First thing we learn, first thing we learn here is that we must have a judgment day. There has to be a judgment day. We must have one. Now, first look here. Jesus says, in very categorically, verse 48, there is a judge. There is a judge. And then he also says, the very word which I speak, or I spoke, we'll get to that later, will condemn him on the last day. Now, what you have right there is a categorical statement. First of all, Jesus Christ says there will be a last day. Uh, in other words, history is not cyclical. History is linear. There will be a last day. And that last day will be judgment day. There is a judge. What's intriguing to me is that he brings out one of his most famous and one of his favorite metaphors for who he is, which is a very positive metaphor, and links it to this one. Because notice, right before he says that practically, in verse 46, he says, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now, the image of light is so um, positive, but the image of judge, judgment, is so intimidating and, and uh, so forbidding. The judge is someone who sits up on top of what's called a bench. You walk in before the judge is this huge high mahogany thing, this huge wood thing, and up high is the judge looking down on you. Have you ever noticed they never ever, you know, the judge never sits at a desk, you know, kind of eye level to you, the defendant, or even where you look down. You don't do that. The judge looks down on you. You look up. And yet Jesus Christ puts this positive idea of light with this very forbidding idea of judgment. And what he's really saying is, without judgment, we're in total darkness. And I don't think modern people have any idea, if you get rid of the idea of judgment day, just how total that darkness is. We have to have a judgment day. There's two modern authors that have really helped me a great deal, and I think will help you very eloquent, two modern authors that very eloquently show what kind of total darkness there would be if we don't have a judgment day. The first one is Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller, you know, is a famous playwright and uh, he, uh, one of, and writer, and one of his plays is the play After the Fall. And in After the Fall, there is an absolutely stunning passage, I think, in which the, the uh, character, one of the characters is speaking, and his name is Quentin. And this is what he says, quote, For years, I looked at life like a case at law. It was a series of proofs. When you're young, you prove how brave you are, or how smart you are. Then later on, uh, and also what a good lover you are. Then later on, you prove, you have to prove what a good father you are, what a good husband you are. Finally, you try to prove how wise you are, how powerful you are, how successful, whatever. But underlying it all, I see now, in all of my arguing, there was a presumption uh, that I was moving on an upward path towards some elevation. I don't know what it was. All I knew is I would be justified or I'd be condemned for what I'd done. There would be a verdict anyway. I think that my disaster really began when I looked up one day and the bench was empty. No judge in sight. And all that remained, I realized, was the endless argument with oneself, this pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench, which of course is another way of saying despair. Now listen what he's saying. It's remarkable what he's saying. First of all, Quentin which, of course, would be Arthur Miller, which actually means the average educated person in Western civilization in the 20th century had given up the idea of traditional religion, had given up the traditional idea of a God and balances and heaven and hell and rewards and so on. And he felt liberated till he says, one day I looked up and I realized there was no one on the bench. And what did that mean? He's, what does that leave? Endless, meaningless litigation. Now, what does he mean by litigation? He means we will litigate, which means we do argue with ourselves and with other people. We say, it's better to be unselfish than to be selfish. It's wrong to trample down weak people and weak groups and, 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 and exclude them from power. It's better to uh, keep your promises and to stab people in the back. We're constantly saying it's better. We're telling each other what's right and wrong. We're talking to ourselves. We're saying, I'm a good person. I'm doing this. He says, but there's no one he suddenly realized one day there's no one on the bench. There's no one on the bench of the universe. He says, there was no judge. 
And I realized, what does that mean? I, that means there is no way you can say one action is more meaningful than another. That one action is better than another. Who's to say? See? And besides that, in the end, everything, everything's going to burn up anyway. And so he says, and now you say, oh, yes, Arthur Miller, artists, they get so gloomy, especially when they write plays. You know, they're thinking, all right, now listen, that's an assertion. Say, oh, cut it out, Arthur, stop being so gloomy. What, here's what I think he has to say. The artist has to say, give me an argument. Don't, get, don't just yell at me. Give me an argument. How can there be any basis for saying this is better than that or one action is more meaningful than another action if there's nobody on the bench. In other words, he was liberated by the idea there was no judge but he was plunged into total darkness because he realizes that if you have that kind of total liberation it also means you have total meaninglessness. Nothing you do makes a difference in the end. Nothing you do will matter. Nothing you do will, will make any difference. And that's him. That's Arthur Miller. In other words, that's the darkness. There must be a judgment day or we have no meaning individually, but not, let's, I want to stop there. Also, if there's no judgment day, there is no hope socially. Not only is there no meaning individually, there's no hope socially. Now, the other modern writer I want to tell you about, actually, I quoted him last year and I've been thinking about him ever since and a lot of you have too. So I want to bring him back. He's a Croatian philosopher theologian named Miroslav Volf. And Miroslav Volf takes on the other modern uh, superficial myth about Judgment Day. The first one Arthur Miller has taken a hold of. The idea if there's no Judgment Day, then we're free to decide what we want to do. I have to decide what's right and wrong for me. I'm liberated. He says, yeah, you're liberated, but at the cost of any meaning at all. Now, the second mistake is people say, yes, if you have a judging God, you'll be an aggressive, warlike person. The idea of a God who smites will lead to aggression. It will lead you to feel like you can go out and just smite other people who don't believe as you believe. And so, you know, the, it's typical. The average New Yorker says, well, if you believe in a judging God, in fact, I've seen it on the op-ed pages, pages of the New York Times within the last two months. If you believe in a God of judgment, you're going to become a person who attacks people, a person who's aggressive, a person who's imperialistic. Volf says, oh yeah? Miroslav Volf, who is Croatian, writes this in a, a book called Exclusion and Embrace. It's not a play. It's a, a book called Exclusion and Embrace. And this is what he says. My thesis is that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance. Let me say that again. My thesis is that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance. My thesis will be unpopular with many people in the West. But imagine for a moment speaking to people, as I have, whose cities and villages have been first plundered, then burned, then leveled to the ground, whose daughters and sisters have been raped, whose fathers and brothers have had their throats slit. Your point to them as you speak is this. We should not retaliate. Why not? What will ever keep them from retaliating? I say this, that the only means of prohibiting violence by us is to insist that violence is only legitimate when it comes from God. Violence thrives today, secretly nourished by the belief that God refuses to take the sword. It takes the quiet of a suburb for the birth of the thesis that human nonviolence is a result of a God who refuses to judge. In a scorched land soaked in the blood of the innocent, that idea will invariably die like other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. If God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a final end of violence, that God would not be worthy of our worship. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying anybody who thinks that the idea that there's a God who on the last day will put down all, will pay back for all evil, all injustice. If you think that leads to aggression, here's what I want to ask you. Have you actually ever, ever really been the victim of injustice? He says, probably not. Because when someone comes and does the things to you that my people have seen, you will pick up the sword. You will go and you will be sucked into that endless cycle of violence, which is one of the, if not, the main source of misery in this world. I have been wrong, so I'm going to wrong, get, get, take, take it back to you. You use the sword against me, so I'm going to pick up the sword against you. He said, you will be sucked into that unless you realize that there is a judge and no one will get away with anything. Now we have a friend who had a brother 
who is who is trained in the use of weapons in armed services, special forces. And this this man had a daughter who was brutally murdered and I think raped before she was murdered. And my friend had to go to that brother and stop him from hunting down this person, even after he was in custody, and killing him. Now, what are you going to say to a person like that? What are you going to say to somebody who, who's had their villages burned down? What are you going to say? You say, violence really just doesn't solve anything. Oh, okay. Or you can say, well, you know, if everybody takes law into their own hands, what kind of society will we have? Oh, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. The only... The only thing that will stop a person who's really been a victim is to say, there is a judge, and it's not you. There is a judge who no one will escape, and it's not you. And unless that's at the very bottom of your heart, you're never going to live nonviolently in this world, Wolf says. And if you think the idea of a judging God leads to more violence, that shows that you haven't had much of it yourself. You've had a very comfortable little life. What are these guys saying? What is Arthur Miller saying? What is Wolf saying? You know, one of the things that worries me is the average New York person, oh, by far, I shouldn't say average, 90% of people in New York City just think the idea of a judging God, Judgment Day, is ridiculous. We all have to decide what's right or wrong for ourselves. What I want to know is why aren't we, like Wolf and like Miller saying, why aren't we, if we've gotten rid of that idea, living in despair? I'm sure there's people in this room who don't believe in Judgment Day. Why aren't you in despair, like Quentin? Why aren't you in despair, like Wolf says you'd have to be, or they sucked in to the, to the, the, the angry despair, <laughs> whereas Quentin is su sucked into depressed despair? Why aren't you? And here's the, from what I can tell, what Arthur Miller is saying, either you haven't been thinking. See, Miller says, one day I looked up. That's when my disaster started. I realized what it meant that the bench was empty. Maybe you just haven't been thinking. Of course, you might. That might happen to you. Then what are you going to do? Or, Wolf says, on the other hand, you haven't really been wronged. You haven't really been wronged. And you haven't, you're, you're either, you're, if you don't have a God, or if you have a vague, toothless, sort of loving God, and you are really wronged, you will be sucked into a bitterness and an anger and a sense of retaliation because you will be defenseless. You must have a judgment day. There has to be a judgment day. And even those who insist there is no judgment day are living as if there's no there is a judgment day. Even those who insist there is no judgment day are living as if there is a judgment day or you'd be living in utter despair. There must be. But that's not all that Jesus says. He doesn't just say there must be a judgment day. He also says here, not that you just must have one, but you... There can't be a judgment day. The second thing he says here, now I'm being deliberately paradoxical. Okay, for a second, just bear with me. The first thing we learn is you must have a judgment day, but the second thing we learn here is you can't have a judgment day. You can't possibly stand in a judgment day. You, in other words, the first thing we learn is if there's no judgment day, there's no hope. But the second thing we learn here, if there is a judgment day, there's no hope. And that's the teaching of the Bible, and I tell you, you'll never have a life transform by Jesus Christ unless you feel the weight of both of these propositions. Let me push the second proposition down. The second thing we learn here is not just that we must have a judgment day, but we can't bear a judgment day. Now, what's interesting in this passage is Jesus hints. He doesn't so much teach, but he hints at the way judgment will be uh, carried out on that last day. There are two principles two principles here that give us indication of how God will do that judging on the last day. And those two principles are, and it's utterly fair, I'll show you why, if you don't believe these principles, without these principles it wouldn't be fair. The two principles is the judgment of God focuses mainly on the heart and it's conducted on the basis of your knowledge. It's, it focuses on your heart and it's based on your knowledge of the truth. All right? Focus on your heart based on your knowledge. Number one, first of all, focus on your heart. I, I mentioned that this was the very, very last thing that Jesus Christ says. And unfortunately, I probably, there's, there was room in the bullet and I probably should have done it. But uh, the, the passage starts at verse 37. And I didn't print it all in here. But the very, very top of verse 37, this is what we're told. It says, though Jesus had done all these miraculous things and he had this wonderful ministry, most people didn't believe. 
That's what it says in verse 37. And then down here at verse 42 and 43, it says, and those who did believe, look, he says, even those leaders who did believe wouldn't follow him. They wouldn't act on what they knew. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. Now, what are we learning here? Two things. See, it's, it's in verse 44 that Jesus cries out. He sees these people rejecting him, and he cries out and warns them about judgment. But now, let, here's what we learn. The first thing we learn is, who are these people that he's warning about judgment? These are religious leaders. The leaders, it says. And who are religious leaders? Religious leaders are people who externally are quite good. Externally are very, very, uh, you know, they obey the Ten Commandments. They pray. They believe in the, in the, in the God of the Bible. But something's wrong with their heart. We know that most of the religious leaders, uh, you know, believed in general and, and obeyed in general, but it was out of pride. And Jesus Christ coming and teaching about the grace of God brought that pride out. They didn't like to be told they were sinners that needed grace. But now to look in verse 42 and 43, and then there were other kinds of leaders who weren't so in denial that they, uh, they wouldn't even admit that this was a man from God. But even the ones who recognized who he was and realized this is, here's a man from God, they were, afraid, they, 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 were, they were controlled by fear and need for human approval. See? Praise of men rather than praise of God. Now, the, so the first thing that we're being told is the people who are in danger of judgment in this situation are not being judged on the basis of how many good deeds they've done and how many obedient actions they have done and how many disobedient... They're being judged on the basis of their heart. 1 Samuel 16, very famous verse where God says to Samuel in another situation, he says, man looks on the external things, but God looks on the heart. Now, some people right away say, wait a minute, how does this fit? Aren't there an awful lot of places that say, we'll be judged according to our works? Doesn't Paul say in Romans 2, 6, on the last day we'll be judged on the basis of what we have done? Doesn't it even say in John chapter 5? If you go to John chapter 5, I don't mean you should go there, but just trust me. John chapter 5, 27 to 30, Jesus actually says that on the last day, he says, I will judge them. And on the last day, people will rise, those who have done good to life, those who have done evil to, ju to uh, destruction. So how do we square what the Bible says, say in Romans 3, where it says no one can be good enough to earn salvation and reward? Uh, with, with the, these statements that uh, judgment has on the basis of works. And the answer is Jesus has a metaphor that pulls it all together. It's not right here, but it's a very important metaphor in understanding Judgment Day. He says in Matthew 7, by their fruit you will know them. Now that's perfect. He's thinking of a tree. How can you tell a tree is alive? Here's June, and we have three trees. I mean, you go by an orchard, and there's three trees filled with, you know, fruit. And there's one tree, no fruit at all, no leaves. How do we know which one's alive? How do we judge between them? How can we tell which one's alive, which ones are dead? What, by the fruit. But does the fruit cause the life? No, of course not. The fruit is an index of a life. And therefore, what's going on? When you go to, say, for example, Matthew 25, interesting place. Matthew 25 says that on the last day, God will judge us on the basis of whether we cared for the poor, whether we uh, took in the prisoner, whether we uh, fed the hungry. And some of you are saying, if you read that, you say, what? Now, those of you with MSWs are very happy about that, but it's not saying the social workers will get into the kingdom of heaven. What is it saying? What is it saying? That's not even in the Ten Commandments. You say, there's nothing in the Ten Commandments about that. No. The point is, the reason that God looks at the works is to find out what's in the heart. If, if your heart is self-centered, self-referential, self-saving, self-righteous versus open to God, humble, needing his grace and mercy, there's going to be a difference in the way you live. But the key thing is the heart. And I'll tell you a reason why this is so absolutely fair. Absolutely fair. Uh, not to... Uh, my wife's uh, grandfather came from Zagreb. My, grand, my Kathy's uh, uh, grandfather came from Yugoslavia. And every so often, uh, he immigrated to Pittsburgh many years ago. Every so often, she and her father sit around saying, you know, I bet you we've got cousins over there who we don't know anything about that are committing atrocities. They're just, and the villains, 
You know, we see these people smiting each other back and forth. We say, what's the matter with those people? How idiotic are those people? Look at the terrible things these people are doing. Well, what if, <clears throat> what if, what if her grandfather didn't go to Pittsburgh? What if their grandfather came to Pittsburgh? What if they were living in a country in which you've got a kind of social stability that restrains the pride of the heart? And what if, what if her grandfather's ancestors were, had never come to Pittsburgh and were living in a place where there's a lot of social instability where you don't have those kinds of restraints? Don't you see? God has to be fair. He looks on the heart. He doesn't, just, he doesn't look in a, in a kind of a calculus that says, how many good deeds have you done? He looks at the heart and says, why are you doing the good deeds you're doing? And what would you have done if you were in different soil? He looks on the heart. You remember there were two sons in, in Luke 15. There was the prodigal son and there was the son who stayed home and obeyed. But in the end, who's the one who's lost? It's not the one who obeyed all the father's rules. In the end, it's the one whose heart was the farthest from the father's heart. And so the first thing we see is this is scary. I'll show you how scary it is. God is not so much adding up how many good deeds have you done, what, what good things have you done, how many times have you obeyed the Ten Commandments, how many times have you not obeyed the Ten Commandments, how good is your heart, how unselfish is it, or how proud is it, how open to other people and to God is it, or how closed is it. See, how good is your heart? How good are your motives? Oh yeah, you're in church. Oh yeah, you're doing good things for people. What are your motives? Why are you doing them for yourself? To, to make, put God in your debt so you're controlling your, your life? To feel superior to other people? Why? Why? He says, oh my goodness, don't look at my motives. But he does. Well, how can he look at my motives? It's the only way it's fair. Because people are born in such different places so, much, so many different times under such different circumstances. But that's not the only. The other criteria for judgment is not just he looks on the heart. He judges you according to the knowledge you have. This is the only way to understand this very cryptic statement when he says in verse 48, there's a judge. Okay? But in verse 47 he says, I will not be the one who judges him. See? He says, I, won't judge, I do not judge him. There's a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very word I spoke. What is he saying when he says, I won't judge you on the last day. My word will judge you. Now that's metaphor. Of course it's metaphor. But what's he getting across? He's not saying he won't be there. He's not saying I'll mail it in. He's not saying anything as stupid as that. In fact, in, in John chapter 5, he actually says, verse 27, the Father has given me all the authority to judge. I'll be doing it. Well, then what is he doing here? Well, it's metaphorical, of course. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, the word you heard is what will be the evaluation criteria. Now, this is extremely important. It's a very simple thing, and Paul draws it out in, in Romans chapter 2. People are always are saying, well, what about the people that never heard about Jesus Christ? How can they be judged? Well, it's the principle. Paul says in Romans 2, you will only be judged according to what truth you've heard. That means what you know. Maybe all you know, Paul says in your conscience, everybody knows there's a God. And everybody knows you owe to love God and love your neighbor. And everybody knows that you, you're really not living up like you should. Everybody knows to some degree God's truth. Some people know a whole lot. Some people know very little. But, and here's what he's saying. Here's what even Jesus is saying. You're only going to be judged on this criteria, have you done what you know? When he says the word will rise up and judge you on the final day, this personification of the word is very simple. Whatever truth you know, no matter where you have lived, no matter what century, no matter what, but whatever truth you know, even if it's just the golden rule, whatever truth you know on the last day will rise up, look you in the eye and say, you knew me, but you didn't do me. Francis Schaeffer puts it another way. He says, there'll be a, there's an invisible tape recorder around everybody's neck in this room. Don't try to find it. <laughs> Don't like that, you know. And all it's doing is it is recording any time you ever say to somebody else, you ought. See, that's, that's what Schaeffer's saying in this metaphor is everybody's got some standard of right and wrong. Everybody has some knowledge of the truth. And on the final day... God will just simply take that tape recorder off. You'll say, well, where'd that come from? And he's, well, it was there. And he'll take it off. And he'll just say, look, I'm not going to judge you by the gospel if you never heard it. I'm not going to judge you by uh, the Ten Commandments if you never heard them. I'm going to judge you by what you knew. I'm going to let the word you heard. I'm going to let the word you knew. 
I'm only going to ask whether you've done what you knew, and he's going to turn it on. Now, this is terrifying. Are we, are we terrified yet? The only fair way for judgment to proceed would be if it's not according to the Ten Commandments or according to whether or not you've done this or that. The, the, the judgment goes on the basis of your heart and on the basis of your knowledge. That's the only possible way to, to, you know, to evaluate. It's perfectly fair. Here's a 10-year-old, here's a 5-year-old. They both disobey. What do you do? Well, you know, they, you, know they, you, you punish them, of course, but you, what do you say to the 10-year-old? You were more responsible. You knew, much, you knew the mind of the parent in a way that the 5-year-old didn't. See, it's absolutely necessary that we go on the basis of the knowledge, on the basis of the heart. But you know what this means? This means there's no hope for you or me. You realize what this means? If you've had a good family rather than a bad family, if you've had, if you've had good moral training, if you've gone to a good church, if you sit under a good preacher, every single... Not that most of you do, but if you... It means every time you come, every time you're heaping up more truth, and on the last day, it's going to ask, did you do me? Now, I know this will cut our attendance in half. But what this means is, this is terrifying. How will you and I stand in a judgment in which God's looking at the heart, not the actions? He's looking at the motives? And in which the more you know, and the less you do what you know, the greater the judgment. You see, if there is a judgment day, what hope is there for us? If there is not a judgment day, what hope is there for us? Do you feel that yet? You see, the liberal relativist tries to get away, tries to get away from the second of those principles. The liberal relativist says, well, there is no judgment day. Who's to say what's right and wrong? You know, let's get rid of that pressure. But then, what's justice? You know, the blood of the oppressed and the, the murdered cry out from the ground. Who's to say, huh? Now, I'm sorry. That does not, we've been trying to show you, when you get rid of judgment day, that does not take the pressure off. But on the other hand, there's a conservative approach to take the pressure off. And the conservative traditional religious approach is, well, be a good person. Do your best. And on that day, judgment day, you'll be able to be proud. And I want you to know, the view that God judges is not what leads to oppression. The view that I will be able to stand in judgment with my head up because I'm a good person, that's what creates oppression. It's a simplistic understanding it's, it's the view that says, I want to believe that there is a judgment day, but I also want to believe that I'll be able to pass. That's what causes oppression. That's what causes the misery in the world. And the liberal relativistic idea that says, oh, we've got to get rid of judgment day, what they're throwing out, so-called baby with the bathwater, is no help. The Bible says there must be a judgment day, and there can't be. That there's, there's no hope for us if there isn't, and there's no hope for us if there, there is. But guess what? Jesus does teach us a third thing here. What's the third thing? Well, in some way, somebody's going to say it was unfair. Why didn't you print all the way through to verse 37? Because it says in verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory. Well, what did he say? Well, here's the third point. We must have a judgment day, but we can't have a judgment day. But in Jesus Christ, we've already had our judgment day. That's the gospel. In Jesus Christ, so you can't get rid of Judgment Day. There's, on the other hand, you can't go into Judgment Day. The only possible way that you're going to be able to handle the reality, the moral reality of the universe, is if Judgment Day has already been passed. So, the, see, the third thing Jesus teaches us is, in, in me, you've already had your Judgment Day. Where does he say that? Well, you know, he come, first, he says it in a micro, he hints at it. But to me, the part that I love the most almost about the passage is verse 44. Then Jesus cried... Now, I know it says cried out. But the fact is that that Greek word is as ambiguous in Greek as it is in English. When we say he cried, what do we mean? Do we mean he weeps? Or do we mean he calls loudly? And the answer is generally both. When you cry, there's intensity, there's anguish. It might be love, it might be grief, but usually the grief because of love. It's the same word. All through, I looked up every other place where this word cry comes out. It says in Revelation 12, 21, she cried out because she was in labor. In Matthew 14, uh, Peter sinking in the water, he cried, Lord, save me. Galatians chapter 4, where Paul says, by the Holy Spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father. Jesus 
is yelling about judgment. Jesus is warning about judgment. Jesus is saying some of the most st- strong things anyone's ever said here. He is saying, judgment's coming and I'm the only way out. The only way you'll see the Father. I'm the representative of the Father. If you reject me, you rejected the Father. I'm the only way through the judgment. But he's crying. He's weeping. Now listen, lots of religions and lots of philosophies say there's a judge. But there is no philosophy that I know and no, no religion that says, and he's weeping. But that's not all. (laughs) We need more than just a sympathetic judge. What does he say? Well, he says, as for the person who hears my word but does not keep them, I don't judge him, for I didn't come to judge the world. Well, you say, wait a minute. Doesn't it say in John 5, he does come to judge the world? The answer is the tense. The first time, he came to do what? Not to judge. The second time, he will come to judge. Well, what did he come to do the first time? It's what Isaiah spoke about. If you go up to the very top, if you, to, uh, to verse 37, 38, John says, Isaiah said, predicted this, when he said, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? John quotes Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 talks about this mysterious servant who comes. And who is this servant? He's the one who's going to bring salvation. But people don't believe in him. Why? Because people believe that a Messiah is not just a judge who articulates justice, but who executes justice. You remember in ancient times, there wasn't a division between the king and the judge. You didn't have one uh, branch of government who, um, who articulated justice, another one who executed it. No. It, the one who judged was the one who was going to execute righteousness. So, so Isaiah says, one will come and he'll be in weakness and he'll be in suffering. And therefore, people will not believe in him. But this is what he's going to do. What is he going to do? Well, he talks about it. He says in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected. He had no beauty that we should des- des- desire him. He was a man of sorrows, a wash in suffering. But he carried our sorrows. He was smitten. He was afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. In the Old Testament, over and over again, this idea comes out. If you you think I'm exaggerating, in Exodus 17, there's this remarkable place where the people are complaining against Moses, saying, we're dying of thirst, and it's your fault. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? And they're charging Moses, and they're about to stone him. They believe he's guilty of of bait and switch, guilty of fraud. What does God say? He says to Moses, here's what I want you to do. Take them to the rock. Assemble the elders and bring the rod. Now, you have to realize this is a court. You assemble the elders and you bring the rod. The rod was a symbol of authority. In fact, God had given the rod to Moses through which he had brought the plagues, the curses, the judgments of God down on Egypt. So the rod is a symbol of authority. It's a symbol not of just general human authority, but of God's authority. And so Moses, I'm sure, figures somebody's going to be punished for this terrible thing that, that has happened. So they assemble the courtroom and Moses comes with a rod and then God says to Moses, I will stand before the people on the rock. Now, my old teacher, Edmund Clowney, used to say there's no place he knows anywhere in the Bible where it ever says anywhere else that God stands before people. Always, 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 people stand before God. How how could he do this? How could he say, I will stand before the people? But he says, I'll stand before the people on the rock. And then he says to Moses, smite the rock. Bring down the rod of judgment on the rock where I am standing. And he does. And out comes the water that people need. Someone has to be punished. But God takes the punishment. Now, of course, it's a metaphor. But you know what? The servant in Isaiah 50, verse 6, that is, that is a prediction of Jesus Christ says, and therefore it's Jesus Christ who says, I did not re- refrain my back from the smiters. So here's the point. Jesus Christ is the judge who has left the bench and come down into the dock. Jesus Christ is the one judge who says, I'm not going to stay above you. I'm going to get below you. I'm going to come down into the, pr- the place where the prisoner is, the place where the guy in the handcuffs is, the place where the defendant is, and I'm going to receive the rod. 
And what that means is if you believe in him, your judgment is past. Your judgment is absolutely in the past. And that's the only possible way you can have a judgment, which you've got to have, and yet stand a judgment. He was punished for you. He took everything you deserve. Now, what does that mean, lastly? The first, so here's the four points. We must have a judgment. We can't bear a judgment. In Christ, our, we've already had a judgment. And lastly, now, in Christ, we can live between two judgments. What makes us unique as Christians, if you'll think out the gospel, is there's a judgment in the past and a judgment in the future. If you forget one or the other, you fall into some kind of trap. For example, self-image. We live, you think we live in a non-judgmental city? Are you kidding me? Crunch says no judgments. But I'm, you're being evaluated. In this city, I've never seen people evaluated on their looks, evaluated on, on their money, evaluated in, in their bank account, and every job. You, there's no secure job in New York City. They want to know whether you're producing. They want to know whether or not you're bringing adding, what they call adding value. But there's no loyalty. There's no commitment. People are judging you on the basis of your waistline, on the basis of your looks, on the basis of your age, on the basis of your clothing, uh, on the basis of your, of your track record, your record, your, your, uh, uh, your references, your, uh, your resume. They're incredible. There's never been a time in which people have been more evaluated and judged. How are you going to handle it? The answer is... Because I, my judgments in the past, I can take off the gloves about my sins. Do you realize that? Because I'm absolutely loved. Because God has smitten Jesus for me. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I can take off the gloves about my own sin. I can be honest finally. I can admit who I am. You tell me something's wrong with me, I can finally do it. I don't have to get defensive. I can be far more realistic about my sin. Yeah, people are always saying, well, if you believe that Jesus Christ just died for you and you're completely accepted, you know, you, I guess you never want to make anybody feel guilty because uh, you've got to always tell people God loves you, God accepts you. Are you kidding? If God really loves you and God really accepts you and you know it, you can be absolutely honest about your flaws. And I can be honest with you about them. And you can be honest with me about mine. But, on the other hand, we know we're valued. We know we're loved. Look what he did for you. He's weeping. He's the judge who loves you so much he weeps. He gets off the bench and comes down into the dock. How are you going to get, on the one hand, the ability to be absolutely realistic about your sin, at the same time to be completely comfortable, completely comfortable with who you know you are in his eyes? Poised, confident, bold, only because, what? There's a judgment behind us. And yet, at the same time, we know by the judgment ahead of us that God really wants people to live go godly and holy lives. So I'm looking to say, I really want to live the life I should, but I am not at all afraid of failure. Or, quickly another one, then we have to close up. How do you live in a pluralistic society when people around you are so different from you? Well, you know, the relativist says, just don't make any judgments. Just, there's, there's nothing's wrong. Everybody's the same. But on the other hand, liberals look down at bigots terribly. Conservatives say, no, make judgments, but they look down at failures terribly. But the Christian is someone who says, my judgment's behind me, which means I deserved. I deserve to be punished, so I don't feel superior to anybody. Yet on the other hand, I realize there will be a judgment, so I can call you where I think you're wrong. I can oppose injustice, but not out of any vindictiveness, not out of any need to, to, to get after you, not out of any need to hold revenge. How are you going to forgive people unless you know you don't have a right, because you're a sinner, to judge others, and you don't have the knowledge to judge? There is a judge, and he's not you. How can you live with integrity? How can you be bold and go after injustice because you know in the end God's going to win? But how can you do so humbly and with forgiveness and without ever feeling the need to prove yourself? Only if you know you're living between two judgment days. Your judgment day is in the past. The world's is in the future. So you live with hope but humility. See that? You live with realism about your own sin but with complete comfort, being completely comfortable knowing the only eyes who care love you and know you. The, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism, which is a very, very ancient document, puts it perfectly, and we'll close on this. The last question, or pardon me, the question 52 goes like this. What comfort is it to you that Christ shall come again to judge the living and the dead? Answer, 
that in all my afflictions and persecution, with uplifted head, I may wait for the judge from heaven, who has already offered himself to the judgment of God for me, and has taken away from me all curse. If you don't understand this, the stock market will judge you, or your waistline will judge you, or the mirror will judge you, or, the, or your resume will judge you, or people around will judge you. The only judge who was judged for you, Jesus Christ, accept him as the weeping judge of your life. For more of this series and other resources from Timothy Keller and Redeemer Presbyterian Church, please visit www.gospelinlife.com Or even where you look down. You don't do that. The judge looks down on you. You look up. And yet Jesus Christ puts this positive idea of light with this very forbidding idea of judgment. And what he's really saying is, without judgment, we're in total darkness. And I don't think modern people have any idea, if you get rid of the idea of judgment day, just how total that darkness is. We have to have a judgment day. There's two modern authors that have really helped me a great deal, and I think will help you very eloquent, two modern authors that very eloquently show what kind of total darkness there would be if we don't have a judgment day. The first one is Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller, you know, is a famous playwright and uh, he, uh, one of, and writer, and one of his plays is the play After the Fall. And in After the Fall, there is an absolutely stunning passage, I think, in which the, the uh, character, one of the characters is speaking, and his name is Quentin. And this is what he says, quote, For years I looked at life like a case at law. It was a series of proofs. When you're young, you prove how brave you are or how smart you are. Then later on, uh, and also what a good lover you are, then later on you prove, you have to prove what a good father you are, what a good husband you are. Finally, you try to prove how wise you are, how powerful you are, how successful, whatever. But underlying it all, I see now, in all of my arguing, there was a presumption uh, that I was moving on an upward path towards some elevation. I don't know what it was, all story. So I'm just going to have to give them to you one at a time. First thing we learn, first thing we learn here is that we must have a judgment day. There has to be a judgment day. We must have one. Now first look here. Jesus says in very categorically, verse 48, there is a judge. There is a judge. And then he also says the very word which I speak or I spoke, we'll get to that later, will condemn him on the last day. Now, what you have right there is a categorical statement. First of all, Jesus Christ says there will be a last day. Uh, in other words, history is not cyclical. History is linear. There will be a last day. And that last day will be judgment day. There is a judge. What's intriguing to me is that he brings out one of his most famous and one of his favorite metaphors for who he is which is a very positive metaphor and links it to this one. Because notice, right before he says that practically, in verse 46, he says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now the image of light is so um, positive, but the image of judge, judgment, is so intimidating and, and uh, so forbidding. The judge is someone who sits up on top of what's called a bench. You walk in before the judge is this huge high mahogany thing, this huge wood thing, and up high is the judge looking down on you. Have you ever noticed? They never ever, you know, the judge never sits at a desk. You know, kind of eye level to you, the defendant. Listen and read along with me as we uh, read the scripture passage on which the teaching is based this morning. It's John chapter 12. Reading from verses 41 to 50. John 12, 41 to 50. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. And then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. 
I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. This is God's word. Now what we're doing in a series, uh, both before and after Christmas, here in the wintertime, is we're looking at what uh, we've called basic vocabulary or basic concepts of faith and spirituality. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, which was a very early summary of the most basic uh, core uh, elements of, of the faith, the Christian faith, and then we're looking at some place in the Gospel of John uh, to give content to each one of these uh, terms, each one of these concepts, because both the Apostles' Creed and the Gospel of John are both uh, dedicated to basic concepts. Now, today we get to a, the place in the Apostles' Creed that reads about Jesus, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Some of you might remember the older version where it says he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. The idea, I, when I was a little kid, I used to think some are trying to get away from his judgment. And uh, the, the judge shows up and he's even going to catch the quick ones. But what it really means, of course, in the, in the term quicksand and the term quicksilver, the old term quicksilver, quick just means living. And what it means is that Jesus Christ will come to judge everyone who has ever lived. Now, needless to say, this is not a popular basic concept. Um, judgment. You know, all I know is uh, there's a very, very successful uh, advertising campaign for Crunch Gyms that says, no judgments. No judgment. You go to, into the uh, Barnes & Noble and you look at the huge spirituality section and you see it saying, care of the soul, chicken soup of the soul. But I've yet to see the great new bestseller, Judgment Day for the soul. It, it's, it has, nobody wants to hear about it. On the other hand, what I want to show this morning is in spite of that fact, in spite of the fact that judgment is, is extremely unpopular, the idea of a God who comes down and smites, you know, a God who comes down and sees people doing things that are wrong and smites them and judges them. On the one hand, I want to show that modern people who've gotten rid of this idea because they say it's primitive at best or dangerous at worst, primitive at best or dangerous at worst, have not really faced up to how much they need a judging God, how much they need the idea of a divine judgment, how much they need judgment day. But I'm also going to show that the gospel, which is the Christian understanding of judgment day, is much more nuanced, much more complex uh, much more multifaceted than the, uh, the superficial view that the average person has of the idea of Judgment Day. Uh, let's take a look and see what this text says. This is, as I'm going to show you, this is the very last thing Jesus says in public. In the Gospel of John, these are the last things he says in public. The very next thing that comes after this in John 13, he, he retires to his disciples the night before he dies. So this is his, the end of his public ministry, the last thing he says. And it's about judgment. Now, what does he teach us here? Four things we learn. And you know, I usually tell you the four things ahead of time, don't I? Uh, but you know what? I can't give you the four points ahead of time because it'll give away the 